So when my dog Kayla was still alive, uh, almost every day we'd trek together. I, I live on top of a mountain at 930 feet elevation, and there's a creek called Pina Creek, which is about 500 feet below me. And I would trek down a trail and spend lots of time down there trekking in the creek. And uh, I had lots of very interesting kinds of uh, uh, inspirational experiences down there. And on one occasion, I came across a carpet of uh, dead leaves, very, very big, large leaves, like six inches long, in various stages of disintegration. And I suddenly realized it was giving me a message about how you could encounter uh, the resurrected Christ. And so when I came back up home, I wrote this piece. That was February the 16th, uh, 2010. Have you ever played this game? You ring a bell and then listen with increasing carefulness as the sound fades away. The vibrations become more and more subtle until you wonder finally if you are actually still hearing it or just imagining you are still hearing it. Of course, there are many creatures, even in this physical realm, who still do hear it long after it has ceased to be even an imaginary sound for us humans. And there are some beings in the non-physical realms who continue to hear it long after that. Creatures who don't simply retain an acoustic connection, but a visual, olfactory, gustatory, and tactile connection as well. And that's only the sensory tip of the iceberg. There are yet other beings in far-flung dimensions for whom the simple ringing of a bell is a mystical experience of God. They are the lucky ones, or perhaps the enlightened ones, the ones for whom even a single sensory stimulus in this densest of all realities reverberates at the causal level, singing of source. Those for whom the beat of a butterfly's wings or the taste of nectar in a hummingbird's bill leads to a cosmic orgasm the pain-tinged ecstasy of the connection to the all. Today, as Kayla and I made our leisurely way down from meditation walk toward the newly fortified waters of Pina Creek, we stumbled upon a new version of this bell game. I saw what appeared to be a mass grave with the skeletons of 40 or 50 large leaves. I picked one up and held it to the sun. It was about six inches long, but only the faintest frame of it was still extant. The outline, some major arteries, and hundreds of tiny web-like struts. I compared several of these leaves with each other. Then it became obvious to me. The leaves had invented a new game. One in which a bunch of healthy leaves would hold their breath, dissolve their chlorophyll, and literally begin to shed their molecular matter until only a fine lattice of lace remained. The leaves I had picked up were at various stages of this game. Some still retained most of their flesh, while others were truly ghostly. Among the ghosts, some had lace so fine that I wondered whether I was actually seeing it or just inventing it. Even Kayla could not help me there. So I appealed to the sprites whom I could hear laughing in the gurgling of the creek and in the sighing of the wind. They told me, there are so many degrees of disappearing that even your mathematicians will throw their hands up in despair of ever cataloging them. We chased them ourselves, even until even our best efforts cannot detain them further. So we switch modalities. There are many ways to see the progressively subtle incarnations of the leaving leaf. So soften your gaze, your heart, and your soul. Then you can follow their game all the way back to source. I will. And the reason I chose it is because and when you want to understand Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, something like that needs to happen. And so let me begin today's homily then. On November the 8th, 1972, after spending eight years in the seminary, I was ordained in, in June of 1972. And then on the 8th of November, 1972, I landed in Kenya to begin my missionary career. And I was assigned to another priest, a man called uh, Father Derry Buckley, 
who actually was from the same area, County Cork, as I was. In fact, he went to the same high school. He was five years ahead of me, and he was ordained four years ahead of me in 1968. So I'm assigned to Derry Buckley, and I have two tasks to do. The first one is I have to learn how to speak Swahili. And the second one is I have to learn how to be a missionary priest. And so I'm studying Swahili for two months, and then I'm going out on mass safaris with, De well, with Derry. And so on Christmas Day, 1972, I get my first gig. I'm going to go out to an outstation. Uh, it's about 10 miles away, and he gives me a motorbike. In Swahili, we call it a Piki Piki. And so I head off my Piki Piki. I got a knapsack on my back with all of the mass equipment, chalices, patterns, vestments, and I'm driving a Suzuki 185 trail bike. So I get to the outstation, same mass, and there for two or three hours, and then I'm on the way back. And it's just a, a dirt track, a, a Murram track. Murram is a kind of a red dust that you find in, in, in Kenya. And uh, I'm driving back on this uh, dusty little track, and I come around a bend in the track, and all of a sudden there's a woman in front of me walking along with a big pitcher of water on her head. So I swerve violently to avoid her, and I crash the bike. And she looks around, she screams, and she runs off into the bush. So I pick myself up. Uh, I've got a very bruised knee and an even more bruised ego. And I say that the picky picky is in terrible shape. If you've ever driven a bicycle and had an accident, the front wheel of the bike is almost at 90 degree angles to the back wheel of the motorbike. And no matter what I tried to do, I couldn't twist it around. So I spent most of Christmas Day driving a damaged picky picky back to the mission in Enduro. That was my initiation right into being a missionary priest in Kenya. But you know, when you work in a diocese which is short on manpower and there's lots of parishes that need a priest, promotion comes really quickly. So within five months, I went from being a neophyte to being the pastor of a parish. In March of 1973, I become what is called the father in charge of Aldama Catholic Mission. And it's a big mission. There is, um, there's a big hospital run by the, uh, the Mercy Sisters from, from Cork, from Cork City. And there's a high school and a grade school. And there are about maybe 35 outstations that I'm supposed to be responsible for. And I always remember on Easter Sunday, 1973, I attempt my first Swahili homily. And I still remember what the text was from John chapter 20. And I take this passage in Swahili. It says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's Jesus chiding Thomas who didn't believe that he was risen from the dead and had appeared to the disciples the Sunday before. Thomas hadn't been there and he wouldn't believe them. And so Christ comes back a second time and Thomas now says, my Lord and my God. And this is Jesus' response. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so today I want to continue the theme I set up for uh, the month of April. The theme I set up for April was, I went to look at the last week of Jesus' life. And last week I did part one of that. I looked at Palm Sunday and I looked at uh, Holy Thursday. And today I want to look at Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Although we're out of sync, obviously, a little bit. And so then next Sunday, God willing, on Easter Sunday proper, I'm going to do a recap of the two homilies and then up to, to Q&A. So today I'm going to focus on Good Friday, hence the red vestments, you know, and then Easter Sunday. So the first thing that strikes me about uh, Good Friday is that in the course of about 15 hours, Jesus has to go undergo four trials. Firstly, he's dragged in front of the high priest and he's accused of being a blasphemer. And then he's dragged in front of Pilate and Pilate interrogates him. And there's this almost a philosophical discussion where uh, uh, Jesus says, anybody who's interested in the truth, you know, will listen to me. And Pilate says, what is truth? And actually, that was the title I gave to my first book. The first book I wrote, I wrote in Swahili, and I called it Ukweli Ninini, Truth, What Does That Mean? And so Pilate realizes that Herod is in town because it's Passover time, and Herod is from Galilee. He's the tetrarch of Galilee, where Jesus is from. So he sends Jesus off to Herod to see if Herod can figure out what the score is. And Herod is this buffoon who's only interested in seeing Jesus work a miracle. He's the only character in the entire Gospels to whom Jesus refuses to speak. He speak to anybody. doesn't matter who they are. You know, he'll attempt to get into dialogue with them. He doesn't utter a single word to Herod. 
He realizes, you know, I'm not going to waste my time on somebody who's literally just uh, thinks I'm a kind of a magician going to work magic for him. I have about, you know, 10 hours of lifetime left. I'm not going to spend it, you know, talking to this guy. Refused to, to, to open his mouth or say anything to her. The only person in the entire gospels to whom Jesus refuses to speak. And then Herod thinks he's a total buffoon, sends him back to Pilate, and Pilate, you know, examines him for the second time. And at this stage, Pilate says, okay, let's get this over with. Crucify the guy. And they take him off to crucify him. So I'm just wondering what it is like in the last 15 year, hours of his life to be dragged before these four trials, these mockeries of trial, every single one of them a mockery. And to think, this is how I want to spend my last day being dragged before various court systems that have no interest whatsoever in the truth. You know, what was that like, you know, psychologically for him? So that's the first thought that comes to me. The second thought is, I want to look at the alleged seven last words that Jesus actually uttered while on the cross. And you have to trawl all four gospels to get these seven last words. Because if you read Mark's gospel, or read Matthew's gospel, Christ only said one thing on the cross. If the only account of the crucifixion you had was Mark's account or Jesus' account, you would think that Jesus died in despair. He says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the only thing he says as he's dying, according to Mark and according to Matthew. And so you have to trawl all four gospels because there are three different words that Jesus speaks in, in Luke's gospel and three other ones that he speaks in John's gospel. So I take these seven and I've arranged them, what I feel is in a kind of a chronology, a chronology that gives us a blueprint for the evolution of compassion. When I reorganize these statements of Jesus, it actually is like, it's like a three-hour re recapitulation of a lifetime of learning to evolve as a compassionate being. And so I'm going to rearrange them in a chronological order. And so for me, the first thing he says on the cross is, I thirst. You find this in John's gospel in chapter 19. So he's desperately aware of his physical pain and the physical discomfort. And so I thirst is not just that his mouth is dry. It represents the entire suffering of his entire frame being articulated as thirsting for water. So obviously at this stage, he's totally preoccupied with his own physical suffering and his own physical pain. So that's the first word. The second word then is it moves into the psychology, the psychological distress where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So now it's gone from just physical discomfort to the psychological trauma. He's wondering, you know, you know, was this a kind of a psychological operation? Was I being fooled by Satan and my life has been meaningless and pointless? So even my father seems to have abandoned me. So it'll be the second evolution of compassion, moving into his own psychological despair. Then at some stage, his attention shifts and he notices his mother and John, the beloved, and Mary of Magdala standing some distance because they were not allowed to be near the cross. And he realizes that he needs to think about what is it going to be like for them? What is it like for them actually right now to see him suffer on the cross as he is? The mothers among you understand what it is like to experience the suffering of giving birth to your child. And now you're watching your child die in agony on a cross. I bet a million dollars that if Mary could have traded places with Jesus, she would have done so. And so Jesus is aware of the extraordinary pain that his mother is suffering, and John the Beloved is suffering, and Mary of Magdala is suffering. And now his focus goes on to them. He's no longer concerned with his own pain, his own suffering. He's focused on them. And he's concerned, what is going to happen to my mother when I'm gone? And he sees John, the Beloved, standing beside him. So he says, woman, behold your son meaning John, and then son, behold your mother, look after my mother for me when I'm gone. So now he's totally focused on the suffering of his family and those who are precious to him. That's stage three for me. Stage four is he becomes aware of the suffering of the two criminals who are being crucified beside him. And one of them is cussing him out and saying, aren't you supposed to be the Messiah? Get down off the cross and set us free. And the other guy says, why are you berating? This is an innocent man. We are criminals, at least. He is innocent. And then he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus, in the midst of his own pain and the suffering of his family, he looks at this man and he says, I guarantee you, this day you will be with me in paradise. 
And so his concern now about the fate of fellow sufferers, even the criminal class, his compassion is reaching out to them. And then number five, he looks down at the soldiers who are mocking him and the crowds who are jeering. And he says, uh, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. And so now, so now his compassion is going out to the people who are living this kind of this illusion and this lie, crucifying this innocent healer, you know, and thinking somehow that they're doing a mitzvah, that they're doing something wonderful. So now his compassion is extending even out to the, quote unquote, the enemy figures. And then number six, coming to the end with his last few breaths, he realizes, you know, I've done everything I signed up to do. I have been in total alignment with my mission all the way through. I never wavered. Even when I was tempted, even when I sweated blood last night in the garden and I thought about giving up and fleeing, I didn't do it. I stayed, you know, true to my mission. And so he says, it is completed. Mission accomplished. And then finally, final words, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And Christ, of course, Christ is using the word Abba are a one. And so it's almost, if it's his final words is, uh, Daddy, hug me. So there's the journey for me. There's the recapitulation of what it means to move from self-concern into compassion and into the completion of the mission and into being embraced by Father, Mother, God at the end of an incarnation. So when I organize these chronologically, for me, it creates a template. It creates a blueprint for the evolution of the notion of compassion. So that's what I want to say about the seven last words. In that process, Jesus becomes what I've spoken about many times. I have a theory that in order to become enlightened, you need to become a serial killer. Become enlightened, you need to become a serial killer. You have to, you have to murder four times. Firstly, firstly, you have to murder your ego. Secondly, you have to murder your, murder your father. Thirdly, you have to murder your guru. And fourthly, you have to murder God. So what do I mean by this? Murdering the ego is a realization that the ego makes a great servant, but a terrible master. And so when we identify with our ego, it gets us into all kinds of selfish behavior. And so we have to murder the ego. We have to murder our father in the sense that we have to transcend the culture into which we were born, whether that's a kind of a, a linguistic culture or a religious culture. We have to realize that there are other cultures, other wisdom traditions out there, and we have to transcend, transcend our own, not abandoning it, but including and going beyond. We have to study all of the other great cultures, all of the great wisdom traditions of the world, and then somehow cross-fertilize those. So we have to murder the father in that sense. And we have to then, thirdly, murder the guru. There is nobody, there is no teacher who can take us all the way, because your journey is absolutely unique. There has never in the history of Homo sapiens sapiens being another human being who is exactly like you, who has had exactly the same you know, com combination of experiences as you have. And therefore, maybe a guru can take you to the threshold of enlightenment, but can it take you across the threshold? There are places you have to go on your own. So you have to murder the guru at some stage. And then fourthly, you have to murder, you have to murder God. There's a great Buddha saying that says, if you meet the Buddha on the road, Kill him. And the very famous Christian mystic Meister Eckhart would say in the, the 1300s, I pray daily to God to rid me of God. In other words, the gods that we make up, the theologies we enact, that is not the ineffable source of our being. We got to let go of that. Now, when I say kill, I don't mean either to abandon and I do not mean to disrespect, but I do mean to transcend. And to transcend means to incorporate what has gone before and then go beyond it. In the same way that a tree doesn't abandon its root system when it stretches its branches and leaves into the air. They remain connected. In fact, the chlorophyll from the leaves is feeding the root system and the, the root system is taking nutrients from the soil and feeding it to the leaves. But it has to transcend its root system. It has to grow beyond its root system. And so it's interesting that we then, killing is about getting rid of the kind of illusion. I just realized last night when I was meditating about this, that there's only one letter difference, a single letter difference between laughter and slaughter. One letter difference. There's an S in front of laughter to make it slaughter. So what does that mean? It means in some senses that laughter, uh, laughter at the illusion of 
separate identity is the ultimate slaughter of the separate self. So laughter and slaughter go together. There's only one letter difference between them. Now, Jesus is doing that in some senses in his life and even on the cross. He's killing his own ego. He disidentified very, very early on with his own ego. He did not think he was just his space suit. So he, he committed the first murder, transcending his ego. Then he killed his father at age 12. There's a great story of the finding in the temple when he's lost allegedly in the temple and Mary and Joseph come and they're freaking out. He's been missing for three days and Mary says to him, why did you do this to us? Didn't you realize that your father and I have been looking for you for three days? And Jesus' response was, did you not realize that I must be about my father's business? So he's trading an earthly father for a heavenly father. So he, he's killing, in some senses, you know, the, the culture in which he's been born. Not that he's disrespecting it, but realizing there are other cultures, there are other wisdom traditions, and he's going to spend maybe the next 18 missing years filling in the gaps, you know, uh, transcending his own culture, building upon it, and going beyond it. So he's killing his father from age 12 to age 30. He's killing his guru in the sense that, born into a kind of a legalistic spirituality, he's going to transcend it and say, you have heard that it was said to the people of old, you know, an eye for nine, a tooth for a tooth. I said, you know, you must love your enemies. So again and again and again, he's transcending the legalism, you know, uh, to which religions co constantly descend. And he's going beyond the legalism of his guru, uh, Moses, in this instance. And then finally, he kills his God. He goes beyond this distant, demanding deity, this kind of genocidal patho pathological character that I talked about in my book, Setting God Free, and he's talking about Abba, or Abun, the birthing principle of the cosmos. So in our own journey, in order to become enlightened beings, we have to go through and do the same serial killing. We've got to kill the ego, kill the father, kill the guru, and kill God. That's what he's doing, the final pieces on the cross. So I want to move on now to um, Easter Sunday and what that means to me. And for people who think, you know, it's a ridiculous notion to think that a body could rise from the dead. Part of the problem is we, we have a very, very, uh, a very impoverished notion of body in the West. We think the body is simply a bunch of systems or endocrine system or cardiovascular system based on a, a skeletal system. We think it's just one entity. The Egyptians had two very different notions of body. They call it ka and ba. One is the physical articulation, and the other is kind of an etheric, you know, energetic uh, blueprint of which the physical body is simply a printout. Um, the Greeks had three different words for body, sarx, soma, and pneuma. And since the New Testament is written in Greek, it is very important if you try to read the original Greek, the realization that when we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus, sarx means the physical body, soma means the energy body, and pneuma means the spirit body. Again and again, particularly in the writings of Paul, Paul says, the sarks cannot inhabit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inhabit the kingdom of God. So of sarks, soma, and pneuma, when Paul is writing about Eucharist, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and in resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's saying sarks cannot inhabit the kingdom of God. It is not the sarks of Jesus that rises. It's uh, either the soma, are the pneuma of Jesus. So we have to understand that body has very, very different meanings. And as you go higher and higher, as you leave this dense spacesuit, there are more and more real versions of the body, not lesser versions of the body, which is what I was trying to talk about in that leaf imagery that I had done at Pina Creek with Kela. Hinduism has seven different levels of body. There's a physical body, there's an etheric body, there's an astral body, there's a mental body, there's a psychic body, there's a soul body, and then there's the ultimate cosmic consciousness. But in actual fact, uh, in some senses, uh, there, there are like seven colors on the, on, the, on the spectrum of the rainbow. When you look at the rainbow, the rainbow, it doesn't actually just have seven colors. It's not just red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. There are thousands of shades as they fade into each other. And the same way, there's a multiplicity of levels of what it means uh, to, to have a body and therefore to talk about resurrection. So we need to understand that when, we, when we're reading about resurrection, there's a much more important level of body which has become visible to the disciples. And so not to get hung up that it had to be flesh and blood. It could have been that, and maybe it was even that, but that is not the essence of the encounters with Jesus. So let me talk then about the post-resurrection appearances so when Jesus appears to the disciples, 
Some people think, you know, if Jesus came into a room and he's standing over by the fridge, everybody who looks towards the fridge is going to see Jesus. And he unnecessarily so. Because the Greek verb that's used to appear means actually to choose to make himself visible to. So Jesus is actually choosing those to whom he will appear in the sense that those who are capable of seeing him. And so the disciples have to kind of shift their focus in order to be able to encounter uh, the, the resurrected body. And I've used this image with you a long, long time ago. When I came to Palo Alto in 1987, I remember walking up University Avenue. I wanted to buy binders. I was just starting school. And I came to a Woolworths window. There was a Woolworths on uh, University Avenue at that stage. And I'm looking in, you know, I want to see if I can get, find some binders. And I'm looking through this plate glass window and the sun is shining behind me. And so all I can see originally is my own image in the, in the, in the window. Until I learn to refocus my eyes and then I can see through the window and I can see what's inside, the contents inside the window. But initially, the glare of the sun was focusing so that all I could see was my own image. And so part of the resurrection experiences is it is a question of refocusing in order to see what's really there, what appears only to be hidden. So let me use a bunch of different metaphors to explain this. Another one I've used is, suppose, you know, I go down to Palo Alto, you know, next Monday to meet a friend of mine who's coming in from uh, Texas. And uh, he's staying in a hotel, you know, in, in Palo Alto, and he's on the fifth floor. And I go into the parking lot, which is three, three stories underground, and we agree to meet in the restaurant in the lobby. I got to go up three or four stories to meet him, and he's got to come down four or five stories to meet me. And that's what has to happen in these Eucharistic encounters, that the apostles have to, in some sense, elevate their consciousness up through different levels. And Christ has to kind of descend from various levels in order that they can, they can find a place where both can hang out together. Maybe we'd call it the astral level. So I'm moving up from my physical level to my etheric into my astral, and he's moving down from cosmic consciousness uh, to the soul body, uh, to the psychic body, you know, to, to the mental body, to the astral body. So there has to be a movement on both sides in order for an encounter to be possible. Let me use another example. If you had no knowledge of flora, plant life, you could never ever infer the possibility of a golden daffodil from an ugly bulb. If you saw this ugly bulb and you knew nothing about flora, you could never imagine that this extraordinarily beautiful, elegant flower called a daffodil would emerge from this ugly thing that looks like a potato. You couldn't do it. Or you could never kind of imagine or infer the possibility of an elegant, majestic oak tree from the presence of a tiny acorn. If you didn't know something about, you know, horticulture, you could never infer the realization of a majestic oak tree from this tiny thing. And it's the same thing without a mystical sense. You can never infer the reality of spirit uh, from, you know, mere matter. If all you know is matter, you could never infer the reality of spirit from just focusing on mere matter. Nor could you infer the existence of the soul from the mere experience of the ego. So there's a transcending that has to have, have happen in order for this to appear. Trying to, trying to measure the reality of, re of resurrection by using, using the senses it's like trying to measure IQ on a weighing scale. That some of you step in a weighing scale and should be able to tell you your IQ. It's not built to measure IQ. It's, been, it's built to measure weight. And the sensorium is, is so limited. And that's what I was trying to get at, this extraordinary experience I had with those leaves, which were in various stages of disintegration, some of which barely had a frame and some kind of a lattice work. And it got you know, dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And then these sprites were telling me, you know, you have to shift out of your sensorium into your soul and into your spirit in order to be able to see the, the further reverberations of the bell, which just has been wrong. So that's what I mean when I talk about Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. And finally, I want to mention this notion of what I call the two crosses. There's the cross of crucifixion and there's the cross of resurrection. Now, the cross of crucifixion for me is not an element of, uh, of torture and death. That is not what it symbolizes for me. Jesus Christ did not come in order to be crucified. He came to be in alignment with the mission, and it got him crucified. He did not come down saying, sign me up for crucifixion. That was not the, kind of the end game he had in mind. It just became almost uh, inevitable that given who he was and what he said, that he was going to run foul of the religious and secular authorities, and he was going to wind up being crucified. But he did not come down to be crucified. And so what, is this, what does this cross 
represent. For me, the vertical arm of the cross represents the connection between God's transcendence and God's immanence between heaven and earth. That's what the vertical arm of the cross represents, the connection between the immanence of God and the transcendence of God, between the utterly heavenly ineffable and the grounded physicality of its expression. And the horizontal arm of the cross is the brotherhood, sisterhood of all sentient beings. It's what Native American Indians would call all my relations, that everything that exists in the kind of the, the physical cosmos, in the kind of phenomenological realms, the realms that can be experienced, everything on that is brother and sister to me. And where they intersect, the intersection of the vertical and the horizontal is your mission self, is the core of who you are and what you've come to do. So when I look at the cross, uh, it's not an element of torture or of death, it's this invitation to remember where I've come from, who my relations are, and what my function is vis-a-vis -vis the transcendence and the imminence of God. And for me, there is a cross of resurrection as well. And there are two elements to that. When the disciples would encounter Jesus, met people, and were trying to explain to them, it really was Jesus. It was actually the same Jesus. But there was something radically different about him. In order to convince their kind of hearers, they had to employ two different kinds of images, what, are, what uh, scripture colors, scholars call the before-after images and the below-above images. So they want to show that Je it was really Jesus, you know, after the resurrection, the same Jesus they knew before he died. And so they say, he, you know, he ate fish with us. He said, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him some fish and he ate it. And when Thomas encountered him and didn't believe, Jesus said, here, take your finger and put it into the marks in my hand and take your fist and put it into my side. And then Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus will say, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so this is, they're saying it really was the same Jesus that we knew before. And, but there was something radically different about him. So now they're going to employ the below, above images. There was a transformed element to Jesus. So very, very often they didn't recognize him. Mary of Magdala at the tomb did not recognize him. She thought he was the gardener until finally he spoke her name, Mariamu. And when she got, heard his name and heard his voice, then for the first time, she recognized the risen Christ. The two disciples on the road to Amos who walked with them for several miles and they were talking about this guy who had just been crucified three days before and they don't recognize him. They only recognize him when they prevail upon him to have a meal with them and he breaks the bread, the fraxio panis. You know, the, 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 he has a Eucharistic encounter and then and only then are their eyes open and they see who he was. He's able to somehow to appear in rooms where the doors are locked. So there's something radically different. There's a transformation which has occurred. And so I see this as a different kind of a cross. The before after is the horizontal arm of that cross and the below above is the vertical arm of the cross. And the intersection is the Jesus figure, you know, whose mission is completed. So in conclusion, what I would say is that uh, when you identify with the physical body, then resurrection looks like a miracle. But when you identify with the soul, resurrection is simply about reincarnation. Every single one of us has done it again and again and again. Reincarnation is resurrection between lifetimes. So when you realize that you are a holographic fractal of God, then the final resurrection is union with source. Namaste, my brothers and sisters.